Hi, my name is Mark Stewart. I'm in the Functional Materials Group at the National Physical Laboratory in the UK. What I'd like to do today is go through a presentation that covers some work we've been doing as part of a European Metrology Programme project called Nanostrain. The focus of this project, Nanostrain, is looking at methods for measuring strain in piezoelectrical materials and devices at the nanoscale. And we're doing this because people are trying to build smaller and smaller devices, and in order to see that the devices are doing what they're supposed to, it's important that we can measure the behaviour of the piezoelectric material at these small length scales. So this talk covers how to measure piezoelectric coefficient of materials in thin film form using interferometric techniques. Essentially what we'll be doing is applying a voltage to a piezoelectric material and measuring the resulting change in one dimension using an interferometer. I'm going to start by looking at the basics of why measuring the materials in thin film form is different and then discuss how people have measured the behaviour in the past and then this will lead on to our new approach to measurement. Hopefully by the end I can show you this a more promising method of measuring the piezoelectric activity of a thin film. So if we start by looking at uh, what happens to a piezoelectric material when you apply a voltage on it, in this case we've got a piece of uh, PZT which is floating in, in space, and we've applied a voltage on top and bottom, and you can see it changes shape, it's shown by the dotted lines. It bands in one direction, which we call the D33, um, and it contracts in the other direction, which we call the D31. And these are the piezoelectric coefficients which um, define how active that piezoelectric material is. And that's essentially what we want to do, what we want to measure for thin films. Now, in the previous case, we um, had the PZT floating in mid space, not being attached to anything. But now, let's, for argument's sake, let's say we um, fix it in the lateral direction so it can't move at all. And we do the same thing again, we apply a voltage to it. The material now will expand in the um, thickness direction, but because we fixed it laterally, it's not going to move in that direction. And it means that movement in the thickness direction, which was previously D33, has now been reduced. And uh, some people um, have done uh, some calculations to work out how much to reduce by, and that's given by this equation at the bottom here. So you can see the D33 is reduced by an amount which depends on how far it moves in the lateral direction or how far it would move in the lateral direction, the D31. And the S13 etc. coefficients are the compliance coefficients, so that's how stiff the um, material is. So let's think about what happens when we make a thin film with this material. In this schematic we've got a thin film with PZT, say a micron thick on a much thicker substrate, in this case silicon, um, of say 500 microns thick and we've actually fixed the base of them at this substrate laterally and vertically and you can see from the schematic that what I've shown is that what would happen to the film is in fact it would behave as if the substrate wasn't there it's in fact the boundary conditions are doing all the work in restraining the material and in fact it behaves exactly as the previous case so this equation at the bottom is exactly the same the clamped change in thickness of the of the sample the same as if it were a bulk material. Okay, so now a slightly more realistic case where we free the lateral constraint, it's still fixed vertically so it can't move up and down, it can't bend and in this case we've got the film behaves again exactly as it were be before but because the boundary condition has been freed at the bottom the silicon substrate can change thickness. In the two equations we've got below here, the first, the, the declamped is the how much the film changes as before and the bottom is how much the substrate changes thickness. So the contraction of the substrate depends on the D31 of the piezoelectric material but also the Poisson's ratio and modulus of the substrate. So let's go on now to see what happens if you remove that final constraint on the base of the substrate so we allow it to move in a vertical direction and you can see in this um, schematic from a paper by Culkin that um, the substrate will start to bend. And that's what a lot of people in, in the early days of making these films couldn't understand, was that uh, one micron thick of piece of T could actually force the 500 microns thick of piece of, of um, silicon to bend. And that um, resulted in a lot of people making measurements where they got uh, piezoelectric coefficients that were much higher than expected because basically they were uh, measuring the change in thickness of the sample plus this bend, and so overestimating the results. 
And this is because what people were doing were measuring the top movement of the top surface of the sample, um, assuming that the base of the sample was completely fixed, and, and uh, we've said that's uh, not the case. So Colkin came up with the idea of using a double beam interferometer to measure the change in thickness of the sample. So you can see here on this right hand schematic that we've got a double beam laser system that uses a laser on each side to measure the change in thickness of a sample. But it doesn't matter how the sample moves or bends, it just measures the change in thickness. And Colkin said that you could use this equation, the standard equation we've seen before, to describe that um, change in thickness. But as we've seen before, when, that, when the sample is allowed to, to move laterally, the silicon will actually contract as well. So this equation is incorrect actually for, for a double beam system and we need to use the one we've seen in the, in the previous slide. Now that's generally accepted that double beam method is a more accurate method to use because it's quite a difficult measurement to make and also because the equipment's quite expensive people have still tried to use the single beam method and see what they can get out of that. So in this slide we can see a schematic of a single beam system and basically here we just measure the movement of the top surface of the sample and we assume that we can stick this sample down to a rigid base with some high, um, high strength resin. So up to now we've assumed that the electrode on the top surface covers the entire area of the, of the sample um, but generally we, we, we don't want to do this because we want to minimise this area because if, if the larger the area is the more likely you are to, to find a pinhole within the, within the film causing short circuit or you might um, want to look at different areas of the film and compare the different air regions of a, of, a, of a sample so obviously we'll need a small electrode for that and lastly, the the, um, the larger the electrode size is, the the more energy you're going to put into the sample, the more you're going to bend it, which cause or start to cause problems with the measurements. But it's this small electrode size which is causing problems, and is one of the reasons why we've we've come up with this proposed method, new method of measuring the the piezoelectric coefficient because many people's results seem to depend on the electrode size um, and depending on their geometry you get a, a big variation between results simply because you've got a different sized electrode. So just to summarise that section on how to measure the piezoelectric coefficient practically there's two methods at the moment so there's the on the left hand side we've got the double beam system where the sample is simply supported held at the edges and it's allowed to bend and we measure the change in thickness of the entire sample using a double beam laser. One of the issues with it is quite a difficult measurement to make so there's some alignment issues and also the back surface of the sample needs to be reflective. And the other method is using a single beam system using a laser interferometer or vibrometer and this just measures the, the displacement of the top surface but we have to completely fix the back surface and that's one of the issues whether that can be done or not. Because it's a single beam system we can scan across it easily but there are issues that people, some people say that you need an electrode size of two millimeters or larger and some people say that the electrode size needs to be smaller than 150 microns. So we decided to have another look at the single sided measurement system just to see whether we could work out what some of the issues were. And you can see here we've got a, a picture on the left hand side, bottom left hand side of a 0.2 millimetre pad with a gold wire bond on it and there's a, the line across it is um, where we've scanned across it with the laser beam and if you make up lots of those scans in X and Y you can get this image on the right hand side and you can see how the whole surface bends and where the pad is it actually moves less than uh, outside the region. And this is a, a sol gel film of one micron thick PZT on 500 microns of silicon. And we've tried to fix the sample as best we can by gluing it to a, a thick piece of glass with a UV curing epoxy, a spun coat on, so it's a very thin layer of epoxy. And as I said, we've used the, the Doppler vibrometer to get single sided measurement. And we tend to measure at a frequency of 20 kilohertz or so just to get out of the noise if you measure it much below a kilohertz. So if we take a more detailed look at the results of the measurements that we did using the single beam method, you can see here on the graph the results for three 
different pad sizes, 0 0.2, 0 0.5 and 1mm diameter. And you can see immediately the results are very different, so there's a strong electrode size dependence. So if we took as a result the displacement at zero x distance in the centre of the electrode, we get three very different numbers, which is obviously incorrect because the piezoelectric coefficient should be the same for all three. You can also see that the electrode, particularly in the case of the one millimetre diameter, deforms a lot both in the active and the inactive regions. And we tried to simulate this kind of behaviour and the conclusion we came to was the only way that we can the only way we can simulate this kind of behaviour is if the sample is actually not clamped at the bottom. So the conclusion was that we haven't managed to completely bomb the, the bottom surface of the sample. So just to reinforce this geometry effect and how big it is, I've shown some finite element simulations here of three different cases. So on the left we've got the simply supported system, which is a double beam system. In the centre we've got fully clamped system, which is what we try to measure ourselves. And then lastly we've got the in-plane stretch, where we, we've clamped the bottom from bending, but it can still move in-plane. And you can see what I've plotted here is the displacement that you'd expect to get as a function of electrode diameter, depending on the different conditions that you're clamping it. Uh, and you can see immediately here it varies from the value from 50 to 250 to measure the, the piezoelectric coefficient. And there's only one sort of constant region, and that's this region here above about 2 millimetres, this flat region on the fully clamped sample. And that's what led Wang to suggest that you could use, you should use 2 millimetre pads or greater. But if, as we've shown in the previous slide, it's almost impossible to fully clamp the sample. Now, we have a more detailed look at some of the simulations that we did. Here we've got a couple of simulations for a 0.2mm diameter electrode and a 3mm diameter electrode. And this is for a fully clamped sample. And what we've got here is the displacement across the top surface with each sample, which is the blue line. The red line is the displacement of the bottom electrode. So if you look at the displacement at the centre of the electrode, uh, you'd get two different results. So where, where the blue line hits the zero x-axis, you get very different numbers. But there are only two constants in these graphs. One is the distance between the red and the blue line, so the, the amount the thickness changes. Um, for both the 3mm and the 0.2mm diameter, and that value is the fully clamped piezoelectric coefficient. But the other constant is this step height, which is the change in height between the active region on the left-hand side and the inactive on the right-hand side. And that's the same for both the 0.2mm and the 3mm diameter. So in this next graph I've plotted the top surface displacement for a whole range of pad diameters and you can see that the step height is constant. In fact, if you, um, it's probably an optical illusion that the, um, the small ones look slightly different but you can just map those across and they're identical. So the step height is constant for all electrode sizes. It's also independent of the boundary conditions. So this is for the fully clamped but we've also done it for the simply supported, so for the double beam system and also the in-plane stretch version and so the step height depends only on the film and the substrate material parameters and it's completely independent of the geometry or the boundary conditions. So those were simulations of step height but what about what actually happens in the real world in the measurements? So here we've done a, a series of measurements of different pad heights, one for the fully clamped sample which is on the top left hand side and on the bottom right hand side for the simply supported sample. And you can see the results in general are uh, very different. But if we look at the step height, that step height is a reasonably constant value of about 40 picometers per volt for both cases and for all the different pad sizes. It would appear that what we see in the simulations is matched by what we see in practice. So now we've plotted the step height from those measurements as a function of electrode diameter. And you can see the continuous lines represent the step height for both cases, for the fully clamped and the simply supported. And you can see 
a reasonably constant value of about 40 picometers for both sets of results, but maybe the simply supported one starts to tail off a bit. But if you compare that to the results of the center displacement, which are the dotted lines, they get values from between 30 to minus 170. So you can see the step height is pretty constant, especially in comparison to the center displacement measurements. So we've shown in the measurements that the step height is a constant for all different pad sizes and for the different boundary conditions. But just to make sure that the, what we are measuring is a material parameter rather than some other artifact from the measurement, we did some tests where we polarised the material to different levels, which is effectively changing the piezoelectric coefficient, and then repeated the measurements. And you can see here that you get a nice linear plot between the polarisation of the material, which we measured using a PE loop, and the step height. And when it goes through nicely through zero, it's linear for both the 0.4 and 0.8 millimeter diameter. So we can be confident this is actually a material parameter that we're measuring. So up to now, this pose step height method looks fairly promising in terms of its geometry independence and the fact that it doesn't seem to matter what the boundary conditions are, how you clamp it, etc. But what's missing is how we can relate this measurement to a material parameter. So we need to be able to get an equation that represents what this step height means in terms of the various piezoelectric and um, elastic constants. So ideally we'd like to come up with an analytical solution, um, which we are looking at. But in the meantime we've been working on using finite element simulations to look at how the, the step height varies with various material parameters. And you can see here on the left hand side a graph showing how the D33 affects the step height and you can see that it varies linearly with D33. On the right hand side you can see D31, again it's a linear relationship between D31 and, and step height. And we've also done simulations for all the different parameters, so it, it's linear depends on S13, the in, inverse of S11 plus S12, and the inverse of the modulus of the film. And also the Poisson's ratio, its de dependence is non-linear, so it's Poisson's ratio of the substrate. And also there's a, a dependence on the film thickness to substrate ratio. We've also looked at how all these parameters can come together, and although we haven't finalised it, it appears that the step height equation is very similar to the lefke dormans direct equation. So it includes all the piezoelectric properties of the film, and also the elastic properties of the substrate. So that concludes the work we've been doing on this new step height method for measuring piezoelectric coefficients of thin films. And so if I can just wrap up by summarising some of the points of the presentation so far. Um, we looked at the single beam method, and although it would work for electrode sizes of 2mm or greater, as shown by Wang, Practically, it proved impossible to actually clamp these large area electrodes and we couldn't be confident that the back of the sample wasn't moving. The double beam method, people have shown that the substrate bending effects are eliminated, but the problem is it's generally electrode size dependent. And another issue is that it's also a difficult measurement to make and a reasonably expensive system. In contrast, the proposed step height method is independent of electrode size. It should also be a much simpler measurement, and we don't have to worry about the method of fixing it to the, to the substrate, so we can either have it simply supported or, or fixed to, to some extent. We still need to do some work on the definition of the step height and, and how it relates to material parameters, but at the moment we can say that it, the form is pretty similar to the Lefkin Dorman's direct equation. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the help of collaborators and co workers in this project. That's Glenn Martina, Dennis Nunes, and Matt Couple at the IBM Watson Research Centre. At NMPL, there's Louise Wright, Nim McCartney, and Jason Crane. As I explained at the beginning, this nano strain project is funded through EMRP, uh, which is jointly funded by the countries within Euromet and the European Union. So if you'd like to learn some more about the Nano Strain project, you can go to the Piezo Institute website. And if you have any questions on this presentation, you can contact me at the email address at the bottom. And lastly, I'd like to thank you all for listening.